welcome to the final installment of Understanding Espresso, a series where we've gone through each of the variables in espresso making and looked at how to use them, how they impact your espresso making in order to sort of understand the process of dialing in better and to make more delicious coffee. Now this last episode is one that I didn't actually plan to make at the beginning. I was gonna to stick to sort of the basics of kind of coffee in, coffee out, grind size, that kind of stuff, brew temperature. Here, I think it's important that we talk about pressure. It's been a growing conversation in coffee. It did reach a bit of a further pitch a few years ago. It's calmed down a bit since then. And the conversation has moved from pressure to some extent to flow. We will touch on that in a little bit. But to start us off, I'm gonna go back to the beginning, a kind of quick history of pressure in espresso brewing. The first espresso machines operated at relatively low pressures. They would boil water, trap that steam, and use that pent up steam pressure to push the boiling water through coffee. Maybe one to two bars of pressure was kind of where they were operating, but this meant you could brew coffee quicker than you ever could before. And in part, that combination of, of quick and pressing is where espresso got its name from. Now the big innovation for sort of modern espresso came from Achille Gaggia's machine in 1949. Here, he, he made a massive leap in pressure. Now, pressures had been increasing in various innovations in machines running up to this, but no one had gotten near the pressures that he achieved with his spring lever. And here you had a lever that you pulled down, this compressed a big spring, uh, allowed water into a brew chamber, and then when you released the lever, that spring expanding pushed that water through the coffee. And here was the first time that we had enough pressure to generate crema. Now, if you want to know more about crema, there's a video up here going into the kind of hows and whys and whats of crema, but it was a huge moment and a kind of turning point for espresso. The next leap forward in brew pressure, I would say, came in 1961 with one of the most interesting and innovative machines, which is the Fiema E61, which probably deserves a, a video all of its own at some point. Now, amongst its many innovations was the fact that it used an electric pump and this provided a constant pressure to brew espresso at, unlike the, the springs, because as the spring expands, it exerts less force. Here, we suddenly had nine bars of pressure uh, as a kind of new constant in espresso brewing. The next big leap, I would say, was probably the introduction of pressure profiling. I think that can be mostly credited to La Mazzocco's Strada machine that came out around 2009, 2010. Here, it still had an electric pump, but it was a gear pump, and you could send a variable voltage and it would spin and produce varying kind of pressures. And suddenly you could create whatever pressure you wanted to, whenever you wanted to in the shot. This was new, this was interesting, and the phrase pressure profiling filing came into the collective conscious of coffee brewing people. It was an interesting time, a time of experimentation, of discovery, and also enormous frustration. Because you can change one small part of a pressure curve of an espresso shot, and you will taste a different tasting espresso. And that's initially exciting, but soon it's difficult to know if you're making your espresso better or just different. I think now we have a more measured approach that comes with a little bit more understanding of what's been going on inside our espressos, and we know a little bit more about how to use pressure to achieve better and more consistent espresso. Now, before we get into the two sections that are talking about pre-infusion and talking about the sort of main brewing section and pressures there, I do quickly want to talk about nine bars of pressure. This is the norm. This is the standard. This is what most espresso machines are set to from factory in terms of commercial machines for sure. But, but why is it nine bars? I did what's here that this was considered to be the average of a spring profile, right? A spring lever will peak higher than nine and will slowly decline as the spring expands in a kind of linear fashion. And someone said nine was the average. Maybe. What seems more likely is that someone did the work and worked out that there's a peak of flow at nine bars. You can read about this in, I think, Illy's book, which is The Science of Quality, and also Scott Rayo's book, which was an e-book about espresso making. I'll link everything down below in the description. If you do a simple test, you take a fixed dose of coffee at a fixed grind setting, and you brew, let's say, for 30 seconds. And you brew at seven bars, eight bars, nine bars, 10 bars, 11 bars. What you'll see is that as you increase in pressure, more liquid gets through that coffee puck in a fixed amount of time. The flow increases until you cross the nine bar threshold and actually the pressure of the water starts to compact the cake, making it harder to get through again. And your flow starts to decrease again. So nine bars is about ish, the peak of flow for most espresso machines. This makes sense. This is the setting that would allow you to grind the finest for a given kind of flow rate. So that's where nine bars comes from, most likely. So let's talk about pre-infusion. 
because I think that's the, the most common place that people think about pressure or variances in pressure. As a definition, pre-infusion starts the moment that water enters the basket or brew chamber generally and ends when the machine has reached its peak brewing pressure. In this phase, we're typically looking to get all of the coffee evenly wet before a big force of water presses right through it at high pressures. In, in theory, having a longer pre-infusion phase promotes evenness of extraction and produces better taste in coffee. Now, the way that different machines do this is kind of interesting. Uh, and there's some sort of automated or, or sort of mechanical solutions to this, and there's some more technical solutions to it as well. The most common one in commercial machines is called flow restriction. And here, closer to the pump than to the group head, typically, but not always, is a small restrictor, a hole that might be 0.6 millimeters wide. And what'll happen here is the pump will kick on, all the pressure will get up to that restrictor, and a sort of jet of water will get through, but it will restrict the flow. And it isn't until water has filled from the flow restrictor all the way to the puck that the full pressure of the pump can be translated through to the puck of the coffee. On a standard machine, this will usually take six or seven seconds. And after you push go, you'll see the pressure come up on the gauge and then very slightly right at the end, lift just a little bit more. And that little lift in pressure is the final moment when you know the whole system has become fully pressurized and the pump pressure is now hitting the puck. Different flow restrictors will produce different pre-infusion levels, though they will to some extent re restrict the potential overall flow. 0.6 to 0.8 is relatively common. Unrestricted machines mean that you have no real pre-infusion phase, and coffee will appear from your spouts incredibly quickly. Generally speaking, I want to see it take six to eight seconds on a normal nine bar machine with some pre-infusion for liquid to appear. The reason people don't like flow restrictors in lots of parts of the world is that these tiny holes can very quickly fill with scale and block, and then that whole group head is out of action. And commercially, that's a bit of a headache. So if you're not on top of your water filtration, you're in trouble. Some machines have their flow restriction in the cold water sort of circuit uh, before the water is heated up, and that's sensible from a scale perspective. Once water is hot, it is more likely to precipitate scale. Other machines do have their restriction in the hot side, and that is just a bit more of a concern. Neither is right or better, but that's typically what's driving the decision to place the restrictions in different places. Personally, I quite like flow restriction for pre-infusion. It's mechanical, it's simple, it's repeatable, it's the same every single time, uh, and I get enough pre-infusion that I feel like I can grind fine enough and have a nice high yield uh, and have a good time. I don't have to pay attention, I don't have to think about it. Commercially, in a busy environment especially, it's a great solution. You, you can go further and have what's called a, a pre-infusion space or a block uh, that's an extra chamber above the coffee that also has to fill that draws out the whole procedure a little bit more, it takes longer for the system to pressurize. Those are okay, those work quite well. They let you go finer on your grind a little bit still. I'll talk about why in a second, but they can be a bit drippy and a bit, bit of work sometimes. There are other solutions, which are sort of manual pre-infusion solutions. And that might be situations where a machine will allow you to open the water circuit, but not turn on the pump. So typically the group head solenoid will open, water will flow onto the coffee at line pressure. That's whatever pressure your tap water is coming out at. That might be between one and three bars of pressure. You can do this until the first droplets of liquid appear. You can do it for a fixed amount of time. That's kind of how it works. And then you might flick a, an additional switch and your pump will come on and you'll have that full pressure for the duration of the shot or until you change it down the line a little bit. There is, and I don't recommend using this, an additional option which is called mechanical pre-infusion. Here, the machine turns on the pump, pumps water in, shuts it off, waits a little bit, and pumps again. That's quite disruptive, because if you've built any pressure and you release it, a little bit like the end of a shot, that puck will break apart a little bit. I'm just not a huge fan of mechanical pre-infusion where you have this kind of disruptive effect going on there. And I suppose lastly, you've got something like the Decent, we can't help but talk about that machine in this series, where you can do all sorts of crazy stuff in a automated way. You can have these kind of blooming pre-infusions where you pump some water in, but you don't depressurize the, the system, you just let it sort of soak for 10, 20, 30 seconds if you want to, and then bring up kind of full pressure. And this, again, allows you to go finer and finer and finer. And there's a number of reasons that people speculate that pre-infusion allows you to grind finer. I'll offer a couple. First, the most common explanation is about fines migration. Here, the idea is that the puck has swollen up and trapped all the little fine particles in place, and they can't really move through the shot during the extraction. This prevents them all kind of lining up around the holes at the bottom and, and providing a kind of sandbagging effect. It's a reasonably good explanation, and I think broadly it is true. 
I think the other aspect of this is that there is still extraction happening in this phase, and, and coffee, very quickly, a good amount of it is extracted, and so if you have a very long pre-infusion, you've kind of washed away between probably 8 and 10% of your puck before you've hit it with the full pressure. So for me, that's the other potential impact. I'm sure there are other reasons. It's still an area where we're exploring and people are trying to understand. But generally speaking, some pre-infusion is considered very good. Uh, repeatable pre-infusion will make your life much easier if you're trying to produce repeatable espressos. Now let's talk about the kind of main brewing pressure that you're going to work at. Now, in a pump machine, this will typically be a fixed pressure. It might be 9 bars, you might have set it to 8.5, you might set it to 6. It's up to you, but, but that's the kind of brewing pressure that you're going to work with. The higher the pressure, as we talked about, to a point, the finer you can grind. The downside is, at 9 bars, that water's under huge pressure and is looking for channels. It's looking for shortcuts through the coffee. The higher the pressure that you're working with, the more likely you are to get channels forming. If you, say, brew at 6 bars, you might grind a bit coarser, which you think would decrease your yield, your, decrease your extraction, but you might have an improvement in evenness, allowing you to have a, a better tasting shot and a higher extraction than you would have done at 9 bars. Typically, lower end grinders can often be quite clumpy, and if you don't declump them thoroughly as, as part of your prep process, those clumps can encourage channeling a little bit more. The reason people love old school lever machines is that as your shot progresses, your pressure is decreasing. Right, so as you start to wash away more and more of your puck and it becomes more and more susceptible to channeling, well actually you're dropping the pressure alongside that, which decreases the likelihood of channeling. This is actually a really nice solution and it works very well. It's mechanical, it's simple, it's repeatable. The downside of a lever machine is that it's work. Now there are purely manual lever machines, things like the flare, and what you'll find is as you're pulling that lever and trying to hit a pressure, towards the end of the shot you'll find yourself pulling at what feels like a consistent pressure, what feels like a normal natural movement, but that gauge is declining as well. So I, th I think that as you brew, that feels interestingly kind of right to do. There are other machines, like the Decent or others, that can do a sort of automated declining pressures, and I think that's kind of useful. And there are machines that would allow you to just step down your pressure to something a bit lower on the last half of your shot, or the last third of your shot anyway. Now we do still need to talk about the world of flow and how that impacts pressure a little bit more, and we'll come to that in just a second. And we do need to talk about some practical stuff about how you might use pressure or think about pressure day to day. Before we do that, there is a little ad from this video's sponsor, which is Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community full of thousands of classes for creative and curious people, like you and me. I love Skillshare because it lets me indulge all the different parts of me that like to learn or like to develop new skills. And I'll give you a couple of examples. On the one hand, part of me is really enjoying Thomas Frank's class on productivity for creatives. And I really like the idea that creativity is a thing that you practice, that you learn that it's a muscle and not a muse in his words. On the other hand, my interest in photography has led me to Sarah Rafferty's class. It's an introduction to cyanotypes and using that technique to create beautiful botanical prints. I kind of want to make one from coffee trees. Now, Skillshare is a curated space just for learning, so there's no ads on any of the videos that you watch. In addition, for just $10 a month with an annual subscription, you have access to every single premium class, and I think that is great value. If you're curious, then click the link in the description below. The first thousand people to sign up with that link will get a free trial membership to Skillshare Premium. Go, learn, explore. Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. So let's talk about flow. This has become a kind of new topic of conversation that to some extent has replaced the conversation around pressure. And in part, I think it's because pressure is an input into a brew recipe and flow is an output. And measuring your output and seeing your output and, and understanding your output allows you to make better inputs and, and produce better tasting coffee. And that's certainly what we saw with the Decent. When it kind of popped up onto the scene, people began to see, for the first time, channels actually happening without having to have a naked port filter or a little mirror under your drip tray and, and sort of looking up and seeing and looking for little channels. Instead, you could see that for a constant pressure, your flow began to increase towards the end of the shot because there was simply less resistance there. And if that increased very quickly, that was bad news. Now the world of flow profiling is not really locked in yet, it's in, in the sort of development phase still, but the idea that a machine could dynamically adjust its pressure based on a variance of flow is really interesting. If my shot starts to channel, the machine could in theory just pull back on the pressure a little bit so it doesn't exploit that channel so much and I have a more even extraction. This is, is definitely an interesting part of the future. That isn't to say everyone has to buy a decent, that's the only machine anyone should have. I'm not saying that at all. It, it's a great machine for the right kind of person and a terrible machine for the wrong kind of person. Person. That's 
true of most coffee machines in a way. But but it's just interesting that the, the conversation around pressure is beginning to move in, into something interestingly practical that, that has real world implications. I would say that, yeah, if you if you have a naked port filter and you begin to see a little bit of channeling, if your machine allows a lower pressure phase, switching to that then would be better than leaving it at a higher pressure. I would say, same with a manual machine. If you're pulling really hard and you see a little spritz come out in a big channel, don't keep pulling as hard. Back that pressure off a little bit, right? You're more likely to have an even extraction by reducing that pressure out a little bit more. Ultimately, I think really big variances in pressure during the shot will produce different tasting espresso, but rarely better espresso. I think having small changes to flow, preventing channeling or extending pre-infusion to make sure that the pack is entirely saturated, those are the big wins. Those are the big returns. Brewing at a pressure that matches the quality of your grinder or its potential grind output or matches your puck prep skills is another good idea. Nine bars is desirable, but it's playing on hard. And you can, you know, play on an easier mode by reducing your pressure. It's a compromise, but overall I'd say you'll get a better espresso. But now I want to hear from you. Which aspects of pressure didn't we touch on here? Are you doing something with your pressure profiling routine that's entirely different? I'd love to hear from you down in the comments below. Now soon this series will be returning to a kind of dialing in where I'll take a different grinder, different machine, different coffee. These will be chosen by my Patreon supporters and I'll dial it in and talk through the whole kind of process. I look forward to dialing in new coffees, tasting new things, experimenting with new machines, and I hope you'll join me too. But for now, I'll say thank you so much for watching. Hope you have a great day.